Hello. Greetings from Finland. My name is uh, Timo Kuosmanen. I'm a professor of economics at the University of Turku. And in this video presentation, I'm going to discuss uh, how to improve out of sample predictive power of benchmarking in the context of uh, DSO regulation. So here's the outline of my talk. I'll, I'll briefly uh, set the, my, my presentation to the context of the incentive regulation here in Finland and uh, how to combine elements of DEA and SFA in that context. But I want to mainly focus on the on these uh, new developments, uh, particularly how to alleviate overfitting and how we can use also the classic uh, weight restriction techniques from DEA in the in the somewhat new context. So let's get directly to the point. So um, here's a little bit of historical background of how the how the particularly electricity DSO benchmarking has developed in Finland. Uh, so we started in 2005 uh, using this kind of very, very standard DEA based uh, benchmarking, which is uh, nowadays very widely used around the world. Uh, but very quickly also the Finnish regulator um, started to incorporate elements of uh, parametric techniques to the, to the benchmarking. So uh, first in 2008 uh, regulation period, uh, there was uh, what I would call a naive model averaging of uh, DEA and SFA efficiency scores. But very quickly in 2012 onwards, then the Finnish regulator adopted a more systematic approach, which I would call the stoned approach, which also facilitates the use of panel data in a more systematic fashion than, than any other regulator in the world is currently using. So I don't go to, to the historical develop in more detail. If you're interested, uh, I have here cited uh, my paper with Andy Johnson in the Energy Journal that uh, uh, describes the developments until, until uh, this year. So I want to more take a forward looking perspective and anticipate the developments in the next eight year period from 2024 to 2031, which has been already like uh, since last year has been under, under planning. And two major themes in this work have been how to alleviate overfitting and how to alleviate endogeneity. I think both questions are quite interesting, but I don't have time to cover both. So I'll focus only on the overfitting question here. So still about the background, I want to quickly just uh, uh, discuss with you the how the how the what is the cost frontier that the regulator is using and how that uh, how that relates to the topic of the of the DEA conference. So this is again also discussed in more detail in this uh, the Energy Journal article with Andy Johnson. If you're interested, I just quickly go through the, the, the basic idea. So the main variable of interest here is the controllable operational expenditure. And this is what the, what the uh, incentive regulation is really focused on in Finland. So, so we want to set some kind of acceptable level for the controllable operational expenditure. And uh, to do that, we utilize a lot of uh, different other variable to, to, uh, to set, the, set the benchmark for, the, for this COPEX. And uh, if you think about the, this uh, regression model, we, we can first of all consider this uh, what I would call DEA part, which is highlighted in red color. So this would be a uh, non-parametric axiomatic cost frontier that satisfies uh, monotonicity, convexity, and constant returns to scale constraints. And uh, so we include here uh, three desirable outputs. Uh, we have a fixed input, and we also include an undesirable output. So we can utilize a great deal from the insights from the production theory, for example, for the for the bad outputs in, in this context. So this, this kind of DEA style framework allows a lot of flexibility in, in uh, that respect and without uh, specifying any specific functional form for the uh, cost function C. But we also include then elements from the, from the parametric uh, regression analysis so the blue part, what I would call it like SFA inspired part then includes uh, also some, some parametric component which we use for modeling contextual variables. And we also have a, 
composite error term that includes both inefficiency and noise. So I don't have time to go to a lot of technical details of how we how we estimated some of those I will return back to uh, shortly. But uh, if you're interested in in uh, trying the, the estimation, we have actually recently published a Python package that is uh, freely available from GitHub, for example. And I have also here linked to a, a documentation that uh, that uh, describes this uh, this Python package. So the package was developed by my former doctoral student Sheng Dai, who's currently a postdoc, and uh, two colleagues from Taiwan, Fang and Li. And uh, I want to also point out that if you're if you're more comfortable using, uh, for example, SFA in Stata, then notice that uh, since Stata 16 version, there is this uh, Stata Python integration that allows you to. For example, first edit your data in, in Stata, which is really comfortable in Stata, but you can also then run this Python package through Stata, so you don't need to know any, any Python language, for example, you can you can run the code in, in, in uh, directly in Stata. So that's that's uh, as convenient as we can we can we can make it for the users. But let's now move to the to the new developments. So on this slide, I have cited a couple of uh, recent papers uh, in the literature of uh, convex regression, which are particularly focusing on the on to to the question of how to reduce overfitting. So clearly, this question of overfitting has uh, uh, caught some interest in the in the statistics literature and also in the in the um, perhaps to some extent machine learning or analytics literature. And I also wanted to point out here that. Uh, uh, by by indicating the affiliations of the of the authors here that uh, it's no longer just my research team that is uh, doing this kind of uh, work uh, uh, we have also colleagues from MIT and Columbia University who have published in uh, in the top journals such as Chasa so it's not just some some uh, freaky developments of the of the freaky Finnish uh, researchers who are doing this kind of uh, work nowadays so what do we mean, really mean by overfitting? Uh, so this uh, figure is trying to illustrate that uh, that um, what, what does overfitting look like, what is underfitting? So if we first look at the, the left panel of this figure, then we see that typically this kind of, uh, for example, linear regression that fails to capture the curvature of the of the function then might, uh, might result as underfitting. So we have a too simple model to explain, the, explain our phenomenon. Then on the, the rightmost panel, then, then we have an illustration of overfitting. So this would be typically an issue in a very highly flexible non-parametric methods, uh, especially some kind of local averaging techniques that put really no, no constraints on the, on the shape of the, of the function. So if you think about the figure in the middle, that looks a little bit like a DEA frontier. And, and similarly, also in convex regression, we do impose the shape constraints such as monotonicity and convexity, which, uh, which already kind of safeguard us against this kind of most serious type of overfitting. But uh, that doesn't mean that, uh, that overfitting cannot be an issue in, in uh, convex regression or DEA for that matter. And uh, on this slide, I try to illustrate why that is the case. So, especially in the context of uh, of the DSA, DSO regulation in Finland, the regulator usually uses the panel data of eight years to to estimate the frontier, estimate the shadow prices and the parameter values, and those parameter values and those shadow prices are also then utilized in the next four year period to set the the acceptable cost level for COPEX. Okay. So in some sense, we are trying to predict the cost for the future. But uh, this figure is illustrating the historical development of the three output variables. So we see that there has been a fairly constant growth in the number of users and the network length. However, the, the energy consumption and therefore also the um, energy transmitted uh, has fluctuated quite a lot uh, depending on the macroeconomic uh, cycles. And of course, we have recently the COVID crisis, 
Uh, currently, we have the, the war going on in Ukraine and the resulting energy crisis. So when we use the historical data to estimate our, our cost frontier, then uh, there is uh, no guarantee that this kind of uh, model that fits very well this, this particular particular time period that it's also capable to predict uh, the next regulation period very well. So this is mainly the issue that how do we predict to the to the future time period. So I come back to that uh, that shortly, but uh, let's first discuss a couple of uh, uh, possible remedies that we can we can take from the literature. So there are basically two two alternatives. One is to to introduce some kind of penalty term to the to the least cost problem. So here, if you, if you want to have a little bit more detail of how do we how do we estimate the stone frontier, uh, the first step is to solve this kind of uh, uh, convex non-parametric least squares problem. So in some sense, it's a quadratic programming problem where we minimize the sum of squares of uh, deviations epsilon subject to this kind of uh, uh, regression equality and uh, and inequality constraints that uh, impose monotonicity and concavity. So the new thing here with this penalized uh, approach is that we in introduce an additional penalty term to the objective function. So we have here this uh, red color K, which is an additional tuning parameter that we need to set, for example, using cross-validation techniques. But uh, then, then we also have the Euclidean norms of, the, of these beta coefficients. So those beta coefficients in, in uh, DEA terminology, we could call them the multiplier weights. So essentially, this penalty term then is trying to restrict uh, these, uh, these uh, multiplier weights as close to zero as, as possible. So that's one, one possibility. So then in the recent paper by Mazumder et al. in JASA, they also consider uh, the alternative approach of uh, of limiting these beta weights using constraints, so they call them they call them Lipschitz constraints because we can also then associate this uh, tuning parameter L to the to as as this kind of Lipschitz uh, constant. So a nice thing about this approach is that we can have also then interpretation for this uh, tuning parameter L as the Lipschitz consta constant, which is. Uh, uh, essentially, we can then assume that the, the function that we are estimating is Lipschitz continuous. So that's mathematically uh, very elegant, but uh, essentially it's the same way of, of uh, restricting these beta coefficients towards zero, like, like the first approach. So we can either use the constraints or we can put it in the objective function. So now our idea in the context of, uh, of DSO regulation is that uh, that of course we have a constant returns to scale benchmark. So in some sense, this kind of uh, forcing these beta coefficients close to zero is not really our in our, our main interest. So we have then considered an, another idea of uh, or kind of uh, um, uh, alternative definition for this kind of Lipschitz constraints to, to restrict the flexibility of, uh, of these betas uh, or deviations of betas from the median value of the of the CNL estimates of beta. It could be, of course, some other constant, but but rather than restrict these betas towards zero, and we rather want to want to uh, decrease uh, devi too much deviations from some constant value. And we can empirically empirically uh, state uh, set this uh, constant equal to the um, median of the empirically estimated betas. So that's one of our ideas. But then we also have considered the uh, very classic DEA idea of, of using weight restrictions. Of course, the weight, weight restrictions have been, have been also similarly used for, for limiting these uh, multiplier weights in DEA. Here we just, uh, our motivation of the weight restrictions is somewhat different. We want to, want to avoid overfitting but uh, but uh, technically it's uh, technically it's the same thing as the as the multiplier weight restrictions in DEA, and then of course we come to the question how do we set these weight restrictions? So our idea is that we we can first uh, uh, run an unrestricted uh, convex regression problem, and then we can set some kind of threshold. For example, we can cut off the bottom decile and top decile of the 
of the empirical distribution of the of the beaters to avoid very large and very small uh, shadow prices. So so that's that's how we can also in practice implement these kind of weight restrictions if we want to avoid very very large and very small uh, shadow prices in the in the regulation context. So how do we then compare? We have alternative ways to to alleviate overfitting. Which one would should we recommend to the to the Finnish regulator? So now we then then borrow some ideas from the uh, modern data science and and computer science literature. And uh, since we have this kind of uh, quite a long panel data from two thousand eight to twenty twenty. Then we split our panel to two parts. So we, we take the first uh, years until 2016 as the training set where we uh, estimate the model. So for the training set, we, we estimate our parameters and multiplier weights. And then the remaining four years from 2017 to 2020, we define it as the test set. So for this test set, we do not really estimate anything anymore. We are evaluating the predictive power of these alternative models using this test set. So we, we take the shadow prices and parameter estimates uh, that we obtain from the training set as given, and then we use them to just compute the predictions for the operational cost during those last four years of the test set. And we apply the usual root mean squared error uh, as a measure of prediction power in this, in this both in the training set and test set. And so the smaller the RMSE, the better. So let's first look into the results of the in-sample uh, in performance. So this is the training set of the first, uh, first uh, time period. And in our comparison, we have the standard uh, CNLS, so that's convex non-parametric least squares. And then we have these four alternatives that we discussed. So introducing a penalty term to the objective function or introducing the uh, Lipschitz constraints, setting the, the betas towards zero or towards the median. And then we had these two weight restrictions. Uh, I only mentioned this kind of uh, idea of uh, cutting off the top decile and bottom decile using the weight restrictions. We have also then tested with the more, even more restrictive weight restrictions, cutting off the, the bottom quartile and, and top quartile of the, of the uh, beta distribution. So if we only look at the in-sample fit, it's clear that if we, if we have the, the classic convex regression, we have the best in-sample fit. So whatever kind of additional constraints or additional penalty terms we, we, we do, it only will hurt the, the empirical fit in-sample. However, the question is how well do these alternative uh, estimators then perform when we use it to the to predict the future next four year period, so then that that comes we come to this out of sample predictive power. So when we then use the parameter estimates and and uh, and coefficients obtained with these alternative methods, and we look at the out of sample predictive power in the last four years, we see that uh, that actually this uh, classic CNLS estimator performs quite quite badly in this in this out of sample sense so any kind of techniques that we could use to 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 decrease the flexibility of these beta weights would help to improve the out of sample predictive power and based on our empirical comparison uh, setting the Lipschitz constraint seems to work better than uh, the penalized uh, CNLS uh, and restricting to the median rather than zero if it's even improvement. However, interestingly, this kind of classic DEA inspired weight restrictions, uh, we find the best out of sample predictive power in this, uh, this, uh, this Finnish uh, electricity DSO data. So this is the um, approach that we have recommended to the Finnish regulator that we, that we, that we utilize these uh, weight restrictions and, and cut off the top decile and bottom decile of the empirical distribution of, of betas. In our comparison, that yields the best uh, out of sample predictive power of all, all methods compared. So I want to still, uh, before concluding, I want to highlight that uh, 
this kind of out of sample predictive power can be very useful criteria not only to compare alternative methods and alternative model specification but we can also utilize it to to consider alternative variables for example or or whatever kind of model specification issues so for example we had uh, also also examined that uh, what kind of capital input or how do we measure the the capital input in the in the regulation model so so we were interested in comparing the replacement value versus the net present value. So we can make a similar kind of uh, uh, in-sample and out-of-sample comparison that I just explained for the, for the alternative estimation methods. Now in this table, I have, I have the classic CNLS and, uh, and our, our recommended uh, uh, improvement using the weight restrictions. And then, then we look at this, what if we use the, the replacement value of capital as uh, that fixed input or the net present value of capital. And we see that uh, whether we use the in-sample fit or the out-of-sample root mean squared error as the criterion, the net present value always yields better, better fit, uh, whether it's in-sample or out-of-sample. So this also then leads us to recommend that, uh, that the fixed input uh, would be better measured by the, the net present value rather than the replacement value. So to conclude, we have in my presentation discussed uh, some alternative ways of alleviating overfitting. And at least in the application to the Finnish electricity DSOs, we found that this kind of classic DEA idea of, of simply imposing weight restrictions uh, uh, gave us the best out of sample predictive power. And I want to emphasize that uh, the weight restriction approach also has the additional advantage of being rather intuitive compared to this kind of uh, uh, more sophisticated uh, regularization techniques that are used in uh, statistics and computer science. So this kind of weight restrictions can be quite easily communicated to the regulator and also to the regulated companies and other, other stakeholders. So I believe that's also a clear advantage of that approach. Secondly, I also want to, want to highlight that this kind of um, modern analytics approach of, of using a training set and a test set to, to validate the model can be also very useful in the present context of, uh, of uh, developing regulation methods. I haven't heard of anybody else uh, doing something like that before, but uh, but I mean, this idea, of course, is uh, easily translated to any kind of uh, estimation method. And uh, so I, I would uh, I would suggest that uh, that uh, there would be it would be useful to put more attention to the out of sample predictive power uh, in in this kind of uh, regulation context, but maybe also more broadly in the in the DEA analysis. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, here's also my, my email address if you, if you want to get in touch later, or if you have some questions or comments. Thank you very much.